makes up for it. Right. Oh, well, there you go. There you go. All right. Uh, we're going to continue on discussing JavaScript. And the whole idea of JavaScript is that delivered with the HTML and CSS is some code, some JavaScript. And for uh, a large part, the purpose of that code is to make the page interactive. And by interactive, I mean that the user does something and the page somehow responds to that. Uh, not necessarily every piece of JavaScript does that, but a good number of JavaScript examples do something like that. And that's certainly a good place to start. Uh, show the diagram to review. A little bit different uh, example. I think this was for my Java class when we were talking about something else. But when the client makes a request from the server, they get back HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. And that JavaScript is running right on this machine. So therefore, any code in the JavaScript that runs on the client happens virtually instantaneously, as opposed to anything that you'd have to go to the server for, which takes a little bit of time. So stuff that runs on the client happens much faster than stuff that you have to go through the internet and request from the server. So the client wins if you have some functionality that you can do via JavaScript and is implemented via JavaScript. The server also wins because the server is less bogged down with handling little requests, display a menu, hide a menu, things like that. Uh, saw a really good example of that over the weekend, a really good analogy, let's put it that way, not really an example, of was at a diner and the waiter left a carafe of coffee on the table. And it's like, wow, that's a great idea, right? And it's a great idea for who? It's a great idea for both of us, right? Because when we want a cup of coffee, we don't have to go and find the waiter and flag them down and they may be doing off doing something else or whatever. And we can just pour our own coffee. We can do that as well as the waiter can, right? Um, and it's a win for the waiter, too, because every two minutes they don't have someone flagging them down, can you get me more coffee, can you get me more coffee, right? So it's a win for everyone. I get a quicker response as a client. The server is not bothered. And something like pouring coffee is something that I am capable of doing, right? That's sort of an important other thing. It's not like preparing some flaming dessert where the, the, you know, where the waiter has to be the person that does it or the chef has to be the person that does it, right? And that's an important thing, too. There are certain things that are appropriate for JavaScript, certain things that are not appropriate for JavaScript. But changing a web page a little bit certainly falls into, into the realm of something that is appropriate to do in JavaScript. So we're going to look through a couple more examples today. Uh, my plan is this, by the way. Today we will finish up some JavaScript examples. Next, this Wednesday, I mean, Wednesday, two days from now, will be a work day for you to work on your final project and to get feedback from me and from other people in the class. Uh, my hope is, is that you have made some progress on your project and maybe just have to wrap a few things up. And what a better way to sort of have insurance that you're on the right track than actually show it to me and get feedback. It's also good to get feedback from other people, right? Um, dare I say, you know, I've worked in this field for a long time, so I think my feedback counts, but it is only one person's opinion, all right? And if you can get a variety of people's opinions, maybe about color scheme, about the readability of the font, uh, things like that, it can really help to give you uh, a better idea of if you're on the right track or not. So I'd encourage you to bring your stuff Wednesday to work on. There won't be a lecture. I will be happy to answer any questions you have, but there won't be a lecture. It will be a work day. The next week, we do not have class. You simply turn in the project. If you need to see me, make arrangements, um, you know, and we can meet that way. So let's will they be here in this room? No, it'll be in the lab. Yeah. 
Um, I say that just in case I forget to put a sign down here. You don't say, hey, you didn't tell us it was up there. So I've told you now, all right? Uh, I, I, will, I, I plan on putting uh, you know, a, uh, a uh, example up, but, or, or uh, not an example, am I thinking, a sign up, but you know, who knows. Uh, okay, let's look at, download and look at the example that we had last time for a minute, and then we'll get on a couple new examples. I do hope everyone had a good weekend. Um, judging by the parking lot, apparently some people forgot that we had class after the weekend. Although even last week it was pretty empty. I was surprised. And what is the date today? The 26th? Apparently the computer is having a hard time after the long holiday weekend as well. All right, anyhow, go into this example, and we have a self-quiz where you can see the questions. It's not really graded or anything, but you can see the questions, and you can show or hide the answer. Um, what does HTML stand for? What does CSS and so on? We can click Show Answer, and we can click Hide Answer. What's sort of important about this is, is just looking at the way that CSS and JavaScript together with the HTML form the page and form the functionality. So if we look at this, we have our basic content is via HTML, right? All the questions and answers are in HTML. The appearance is controlled by CSS. In other words, we make the answers, that is everything with a class of answer, invisible. And our JavaScript code has an on-click method. We point to the thing on the page that we want to change, and we change it to the value. So the three pieces of the JavaScript are a user event, which starts the ball rolling. We use the DOM to point to the thing document, get element by ID, find the thing on the page that has this ID. I want to change something about the style. Specifically, I want to change the visibility, and I want to change it to visible. Uh, and the hide button does the same thing and changes it to uh, hidden. Now, real quick, um, this is sort of advanced for those of you that have done programming. I'm going to take and make sort of a slight variation for this. Do you notice there's a lot of repetitive code here? All right, and repetitive code is sort of the enemy of the programmer. So if you've not written like C-sharp code or anything like that, just think nice thoughts for the next two minutes or so. All right, but for those of you that have, I want to sort of give you sort of an advanced thing. We can eliminate this repetitive code by writing what's called a function. All right, and a function is where we take a statement or a group of statements and put it by itself so that we can just call that function and we don't have to repeat the statement. So we can call the function from various places. What's more, we can create a function that accepts an argument. And what an argument is, is it's a value for the function to use. 
All right. So if you notice this line here, this on click, we're doing the exact same thing. The only difference is we're doing it to a different ID. Here we're doing answer one, here we're doing answer three, two, and here we're doing answer three. Well, if you wrote a function to do uh, the Pythagorean theorem, a squared plus b squared equals c squared, you wouldn't write a different function if the values were one and a different function if the values were two. You know, you wouldn't write different va functions just for different values. You would write one function that could do any calculation as long as you gave it the values. And that's what we're going to do here. I'm going to save this real quick as quiz function. And I'm going to make two functions. And we're going to do that in a script tag. A script tag is like a style tag in that it tells the browser, hey, this is not HTML code. In this case, it is saying, hey, this is CSR, this is uh, JavaScript code. So I'm going to write a function called show. And it's going to accept as an argument an ID. And what it's going to do is it's not going to set visible a specific ID, but whatever value we give it in the argument. So now, I'm going to say, in place of that long JavaScript statement, and keep in mind, we could actually have a bunch of JavaScript statements, not just one, all right? But we could do, in place of that, we could do show answer one. And then we could do the same thing for the hide. Now again, for one simple statement like this, probably doesn't matter all that much, but imagine if there's a lot of statements. This does a couple different things. It makes this code real clean and easier to read. One of the big cost of making changes to software is how hard or easy it is to change. Because how much it costs to change software is really a, a big issue. All right? And therefore, anything you can do to make your code easier to read is, will pay dividends in the long run. And in this case, we've made a couple of nice improvements. Number one, this code becomes really easy to read. We don't have that giant, ugly JavaScript statement in the middle of it that sort of clutters the page. We just have a nice little, OK, when we click on it, we call this function. And we call this function to the thing that has a ID of answer 1. This takes that ID and does it. Secondly, if these were a bunch of, if there were a bunch of statements that we need to do here, it would really make that much easier to read because we'd have still have one function call and all the statements would just be written once. The other advantage of that is if there's a bug in the statements, if there happened to be a problem, if we got something wrong, for example, we would only have to fix it in one place. So I'm going to go and do this for the other two buttons. And remember to change the ID for those other two buttons. As a software developer, anytime you see duplicated code, it should be a warning to you. Can I do this a little bit better? Now, yeah, this is duplicated of that pretty much. But, you know, that's a simple, that's one simple line duplicated as opposed to one complicated line duplicated or even worse, several complicated lines duplicated. So if I did this right, functionally it should still work the same.
but it doesn't. When I click hide answer, it shows it. Oh. Hey, I have a bug there, but guess what? Guess what? I just need to fix it in one place. All right, and you're in business. So that's sort of a little bit advanced thing for those of you who have maybe done a little bit of programming. Uh, it's not that much harder, but it, it really provides some benefits. Show all? Well, we could do this could do this a whole bunch of different ways. All right. We could we could simply say this is the most straightforward way. On click, we write a show all function. And And the hide all would be the same, of course. It would be just. And the simplest way to do this would be to do this. We only got three. So I could just say show our, I could just explicitly name them. Now that's no fun, though, right? All right. So we could do this. Use a for loop, which I'm sure if you've done any programming, you've seen. That's going to loop through the first time through and make i equal to 1, second time through and make i equal to 2, third time through and make i equal to 3. And we could say show, because really, what's the difference between all of them? All of them start with the word answer, plus we're going to add the variable i. JavaScript is what's called a dynamically typed language. I usually say weakly typed, but um, it is similar. Weakly typed is another way to say it. Um, but dynamically typed is a term I've, he I've heard lately, and, and I like that. What that means is, in other programming languages, when you create something, you say what it is. You say this is a number. These are letters. This is a Boolean. That means true or false. In JavaScript, it sort of figures out what something is, how you use it. And that can change. So for example, here it's treating i like a number. Here it's treating it like a string. So you can add it on to the word answer and get answer 1, 2, and 3. That is kind of good, but kind of bad. That can be dangerous. Uh, strongly typed languages are my preference because you have to be explicit about that. Um, Believe it or not, when, when a language does something for you, you might think, oh, that's great. It's great when something does something for me. You know? I love when someone makes me breakfast. You know? I love when someone washes my car for me. I love when things get done for me. Well, that's not quite so true in programming. Because when things get done for you, they get done for you in a certain way, and that might not be the way that you like. That might not be the way that you want. All right? So therefore, I prefer what are called uh, strongly typed programming languages, where if I have a number and I want to treat it like a string, I have to explicitly say, treat this like a string. All right? So now this should work as well. And there you go. All right, let's look at some other examples. OK. Well, again, keep in mind that the recipe is the same. Like, we could make this a link if we wanted to. So let's go into here. I mean, I have a button, and I say on click, but I could actually make this a link. A
href equals pound, let's say. So I'll just send it to the top of the page. I'll do this one. I'll do the first one differently, all right, uh, on this other example. So if we do this, uh, screwed something up. All right, I click that and it shows it. So it's like the same thing. We could even make it where it's on hover. So we could say, and then we could do the same thing with hide answer. And the hide, the, the hover event is on mouse over on mouse actually we only need we could do this with just one link because if we put the mouse over we do one thing on mouse out we do another thing Shows it, you take your mouse off, it hides it. Um, thing about this is, again, this is really good. This is one of those things where, you know, we call it a lab for a reason. You know, a lab is a good chance for you to experiment with things. Um, I'm showing building blocks, bits and pieces, but you can take them and adapt them and play with them and try all different kinds of things. We could even do something. We could make the show and hide work uh, with just one button that when we click the button, we actually change the name of the button to, to hide if it's visible and show if it's hidden, and then make the button behave differently depending on whether it's shown or hidden. All right, so um, a lot of different variations of this we could do. Uh, the point I'm trying to get across in this is sort of the basic formula. You have these HTML events that exist on HTML elements. They start with on. And they, they're typically the actions that a user can take on the page. So the user can put their mouse on something. They can take their mouse off of it. They can click on something. They can t press a key and so on. And if you Google JavaScript events, it will show you uh, an exhaustive list of them. And we're just going to pick a few. But basically, it works the same. Um, Twitter, for example, um, they count how many characters you have left, right? At least they used to. Um, and it shows you in a box how many characters you have left. Well, there's an event after you press a key, it looks to see how many characters you've typed in, and it subtracts it from the upper limit, and it tells you, well, you have this number of characters left. Okay, let's look at other examples. Here's a good one. Here we have pictures of zoo animals and as we mouse over them we show the bigger picture. And this is a pretty common sort of piece of JavaScript functionality. Um, a lot of times, you know, this is a real estate issue. Um, if you have a lot of pictures, you might not necessarily want to show a web page that has all of the full versions of those pictures. So you create what are called thumbnails, and thumbnails essentially are a smaller version of the image. 
but then you allow people to choose which one they want to see, either by putting their mouse over it or by clicking it. All right. Now, a couple things about thumbnails. Um, if you notice, these thumbnails, there's a slight difference between the size of these thumbnails and the, the ratio. This one, these two are actually the same ratio of, of height to width. This one's actually slightly taller than the other two. Um, one thing I often do when I create thumbnails is I will make sure that they are all the, all the same size and all the same aspect ratio. And one thing you could do with thumbnails even is a thumbnail doesn't have to be simply a copy of the image. I could make maybe just the lion's face a thumbnail. All right, and then when you put your mouse over it, it brings up the full picture that shows everything. All right, so don't think of thumbnail as simply being the uh, literally a smaller version of the picture. All right, because you can get a little creative, and you can even create a little, you know, mystery and, and interest in it. Like imagine if the the uh, you know imagine if the thumbnail only showed the paw. You know, you might like, oh, what is that? You know, and you, you, oh, you can tell it's a lion or some kind of cat, but you could then go and, and put your mouse over it and see it. So be a little creative with this. Now let's look at how this one was accomplished. Um, again, notice how the HTML, the CSS, and the JavaScript all work together. All right? I have my HTML. I have then a section for the thumbnails, which is an unordered list. That makes sense, right? That's essentially what these thumbnails are, an unordered list of images. I then have a section, and I have a single big image. I then use my style to position things the way I want it to. So I'm using floating. I'm making my thumbnails 100% of the width. So that means that as the screen gets smaller, oops, the thumbnails get smaller. So that's very responsive code. I do the same thing with the big picture. Notice that my thumbnails are actually different images than the big image. I have for every image, I have one T. Uh, the, the thumbnail ends with T. So 1T, 2T, 3T, and then the big image is simply the number of the image. So I actually literally went and created a copy of each image. Let's there is the big image. Trying to view this. Let me let me open this up in a browser. All right, there's a big image of the lion, and there's a small image of the lion. So I actually physically edit it to make it smaller. And if we look at the size of this, you'll notice that that is 161, I'm sorry, 165,000 bytes. This is 21,000 bytes. So if you had a whole bunch of thumbnails, all right, it would benefit you to make smaller versions of them, as opposed to just making, using your CSS to make the images smaller. OK, enough about that. I simply did very similar to what I did in the other one. On mouse over, I go and I change the big image to the big version 
of the thumbnail. Notice the line that does it, on mouse over. All right, so on mouse over is the user action that I want to write some code for. So when I put my mouse over, what? The thumbnail. Now when I put my mouse over the big image, when my mouse is on the big image, I don't do anything. But when my mouse is over the thumbnail, I want to go and do something. What do I want to do? On the document, on the web page, find the thing whose ID is big. All right? This image has an ID of big. I want to change the .src of it. .src. It's not like a coincidence that those are the same thing. Just like the visibility, style visibility in the other earlier example is the exact same thing that we had in CSS. All right? Style visibility. So in this case, SRC. And what do I want to change it to? I want to change it to the name of the image that I want to use there. So in this case, 1JPEG, 2JPEG, 3JPEG. If I put my mouse out of it, I don't really need to do anything. So I don't have an on mouse out here. So that will give me this behavior. If I take my mouse out of it, it just leaves it there. It has to have some picture there, right? So might as well have the last one that you chose. All right, I have a different version of this. I don't remember what it does, but we'll see. Oh, I think you just have to click on the image. And really the only difference between this and that will be, oh, I did two things different. I have an on click event instead of an on mouse over, and I call a function. And I call a function to change both the image, the SRC, again, that equals that out of necessity. We have to say what attribute we want to change. We want to change the source attribute. And we also want to change the alternate text. So again, notice that if I had 100 of these, I would only have to have this code written once. And I simply call that function, change image. Well, here's the access key. Access key is an accessibility thing. Uh, if I do, is it control three? Yeah, I could use the keys to switch between the images. That's an accessibility thing, uh, either for people that are visually impaired, although it's, in this case, given it's for images, it really wouldn't benefit for that, but for people that had uh, carpal tunnel or other motor control issues, it might be easier for them to navigate that way. I could certainly put some explanation on the screen that said what that would do, you know. Um, Generally speaking, if any typical internet user saw this, they would probably know these are thumbnails, and they'd probably know either mouse over or click them to do that. But I could put something like the number that would say Windows Alt 1, 2, and 3 will bring up the appropriate uh, image. All right. Another example, um, Let's look at menu.
All right. Oh, I was clever that day, ZSPN instead of ESPN. This is similar to, this is a smaller version of ESPN.com. And I don't mind going to this page today because the Browns won. So we won't be greeted with any bad news. So if you remember, when we download this, we actually get not just the stuff that we see, but some HTML that's been hidden from us via CSS. And we have JavaScript that shows and hides that extra content based on what we do here. Well, what I did in this example is I took and have a real scaled down version of it. Because if we looked at the code for that example, there'd be so much going on that it would be difficult to isolate on exactly what we're interested in. So I have this menu item. If I put my mouse over that, I get the submenu. Put my mouse over that, I get the submenu. Mouse over that, I get my submenu. All right. So let's look at that. Do remember that I've simply put things in as a convenience. Uh, in one file. You could put the CSS, in fact, you probably should put the CSS in a different file. And you could even put the JavaScript in its own file and create functions for it. All right, what do I have here? I have my nav section. I have some unordered lists. The first one is the main menu, and it contains the three things that you see on the top of the page. Menu item one, menu item two, and menu item three. So I have three LIs. Each LI consists of a link that says menu item one, menu item two, and menu item three. So that is those three links. What do I do with that? The main menu, I make a width of 100%. I float it to the left, and I have no margin on it. I also have given a width of 200 pixels to each LI, and I make the LI display in line block. I make sure the nav has a minimum width of 700 pixels. All the nav ULs. I have list style type none. And then every link I have given a size of 1.1 am, Arial, and all that. And on the link cover, I change the, I, I reverse the, the color. So it's, it's uh, blue text on white background. When I put my mouse over it, it is white text on a blue background for all of them. So that's my basic. CSS. The HTML, all it does is on mouse over, it shows the submenu associated with it. So in addition to the main UL, the main menu UL, there's a UL for each of the submenus. Submenu 1, submenu 2, submenu 3. And so when I put my mouse over the first menu item, it shows submenu 1. When I take the mouse off, it sh uh, gets rid of submenu 1. All right? Pretty basic stuff. Um, now, there's a couple of gotchas here. All right? I also have to do this on the submenu. I have to have the on mouse over. Imagine if I didn't have that on the submenu. I'm deleting that temporarily. Put my mouse on it, show it. The minute I took my mouse off that, though, it would disappear. So I have to have code here as well to say 
all right, if the mouse is on this guy, also display that sum menu. I also have to make sure that there is no gap between these, that these line up right. Whoops. Because what if there is a margin? Uh, let's see. Let's give a margin of 10 pixels. I have my mouse there. I'm never going to be able to put my mouse be quick enough to get it over there because I'm, I'm going through that 10 pixel margin. So I have to make sure that those things are right on top of each other with no space in between them. So now I can do that. I give every UL the same width. I give every UL the same width. No, where is that? Nav U, where, where do I do that? I give every LI the same width. And I give these a corresponding width so that these So that these things line up right underneath and not like off there. Like if I did, like if I made the width of this different, then the submenu would be way over there. The first one lined up, but the second one didn't. The interesting thing about this is we're doing a lot of things and adding a lot of functionality to our page with basically just doing a couple of things in JavaScript. It's just that we're applying those things just to different purposes. The code for this is not that much different than the code to show and hide the answer. It's just done on different things. Go ahead. What do you do here on the, web, on, uh, the mobile? Web? On the mobile, um, what let, does it look like? that's a good question. Um, yeah, I have a concern about uh, things like Outlook. Well, it does. You, but we could, if we're concerned about that, we can make it on click. Keep in mind I'm showing basic techniques here. Uh, the more that you do, you can learn how to give someone a different page. This knows that change it to clicking on a mobile device, so that translates. Um, really, the, the best way to do it would be test it. And do remember that you can always um, write CSS to handle it differently. And you can always write JavaScript to handle it differently. Or sort of the, the um, last resort option is you can always direct people to different pages. You have a desktop page that you think is the best desktop page in the world, but something about it doesn't work well uh, for it, and you don't want to change it, you can always direct them to a, a mobile version of the page. If, number one, you try it and you can't alter it using JavaScript or server-side scripting or CSS to be, simply behave differently in a mobile, you can actually send them to a totally different page. So a lot of options when you get into mobile web development of how to handle that. Uh, my main purpose in this class is to, number one, uh, not do anything uh, to learn how to apply good CSS and learn how you can apply a different CSS in the mobile. But there's a whole bunch of other tricks that you can have uh, on your sleeves, uh, 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 up your sleeves, rather, uh, that you can use to, uh, to handle situations like that. 
Let's see if we have time for one more example. I am really intrigued by this one that said tuition, because I have no idea what that is. I mean, I know what tuition is. This was, this is not a JavaScript example. This just simply showed how you could use a class and a table. This is a leftover table example. Uh, for example, at LC, 13 through 18 credit hours you get the same fee for. What if you wanted to display those differently? And I was just demonstrating that you could use a class. Oops, that's not what I wanted. You could use a class on the rows that you wanted to display differently to give them a different look. So yeah, that's not a JavaScript example. Um, other things that JavaScript is commonly used for, so I won't include that in the examples I upload. Other things that, are, that JavaScript is commonly used for is... See if there's anything good in here. If not, we'll give up. Oh, this is the same thing, but with rabbits instead of zoo animals. Yeah, same thing. All right, so we'll leave that here. Another thing that, that uh, JavaScript is often used for um, is form validation. So for example, if you have a form that a certain field is required, there are HTML5 input controls that say, hey, this is a required field. But you can also use a form element to uh, force it and make sure that there is a value uh, entered in there. Uh, so you can use HTML form uh, controls or you can use JavaScript code to uh, do a validation for that. Um, let me see real quick if I can find a JavaScript validation example because it would be good just to look at it. Oh, W3 Schools has that. So, if you really want to see how to do it, if there's nothing there, oh, snap, something went wrong. There we go. Can look, look at this example. And essentially, when you submit the form, you have a onClick method that calls my function, and our function grabs the value from the, the box and looks to make sure that it's valid and displays an error message if it's not valid. So that's something that is commonly used for JavaScript as well. So if you are interested, take a look at that. All right. Remember, Wednesday is a work day, so meet up in lab. I strongly, strongly, strongly encourage you 
to show up, to share what you have done so far with me and the other people in the class. Um, every semester I think of making this like mandatory for a grade, um, but I'm not, but it is beneficial for you and uh, it will, I think, translate to uh, possible improvements of your grade by showing it to me early and by showing it to the other students in the class. All right, I'm going to gather the materials here, then I will be upstairs.